in um, our days that, well, let me put it like this. There are days like we've never seen because of what takes place in the world, but at the same time, there are days of breakthroughs, suddenlies. I mean, you know, God can heal a body suddenly. In the book of Acts, the Bible said in one moment, whole cities turned to the Lord. That's one of the things I, I'm excited about, the, that, that that could take place, a whole city coming to Jesus right before he comes, you know, because uh, I believe we're still living in the book of Acts. Acts really doesn't end. We're just, we're just book of Acts 2022. Hallelujah. But we were, we've been teaching a series, and uh, gosh, I think we've taught about 16 lessons since February on this subject, and we're breaking it down, even some supplemental things we're doing on Wednesday nights. But I had an urgency this morning to just kind of interject something along the lines of end times. Now, usually lately for a while now, I've been doing just kind of an end times update um, on, on Sunday mornings. And the reason that is, I'm so passionate about it is I was teaching uh, about 10 years ago. I was in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, they'd asked me to come teach on eschatology. And, um, and after the first night, I was just kind of frustrated because it was so difficult because of the, the, the language barrier. And then you're trying to communicate a new subject. And I just, man, I just felt like I was getting very far. And just while we're standing outside and I'm thinking about that, and that's going on in my mind, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, draw a timeline. But when I, so I, you know, I began to teach the rest of that time and in the rest of the other cities that we were in as I was teaching, I would just draw, a, a, prepare a timeline. And when we would go to certain sections, I, because in times it's like pieces of a puzzle. So if you know where to put the pieces, because some things don't fit right. You know, if you try to have a puzzle and the pieces don't fit, you, you just can't make it fit, right? It's got, to, it's, fit, it's got to fit right. And so in, in times when you see, you've got pictures in Daniel and Ezekiel. And so you have all these different pictures. And, and uh, so when you know where to put it, then you just begin to see. But really the main thing about it, really that just began to light me up when that happened, because I know the Holy Spirit and I know what he spoke to me when he said that, uh, I realized how, how, how short time is, how close we are to the end. I realize that it just it just like man we are we are just wrapping this thing up and we are we are here at the end and then of course as and several years ago I mean I was teaching in Spain and man when I got by the time I got through teaching in Spain man they're all freaking out thinking man Jesus is about to come you know I'm freaking them out you know I'm like well yeah I mean that's it's supposed to light us up you know people that live with the fact that the awareness that Jesus is coming live a more holy life than other people do. Because John said it's the hope that purifies. And so as we, so we have to keep it before us. And I know, you know, the Bible says in the last days, people are going to say, you know, where's the promise of the coming for all, all, the, all the time? Everybody's been saying Jesus is coming. Well, that's true. And everyone said, well, yeah, well, you've been saying we're living in the last days. For, well, well, we are living in the last days. Jesus started the last days. The book of Acts says in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. So we're, there must be something that tells us we're kind of here towards the end. Well, when you look at that and you see the pictures and you see now even more and more what's taking place in the world, what's taking place in the church, what's taking place in society, you realize, man, we are so close and people need to wake up. We don't need revival. We need an awakening. I'm talking about in the body of Christ and what's going on land. And so, you know, so what really stirred me is because of what's taking place, I mean, things aren't going to get easier. They're actually going to get harder. As they're, and what I mean, mean by harder, because of what's taking place, our stand sometimes becomes a little more difficult, as you can, I mean, you got, I mean, just thinking, how many of you have seen, for example, coaches that want to pray after a football game, and the schools totally fired them? Well, one of those guys got reinstated. But I mean, but you have situations where if you try to take a stand for what's right, the righteous are going to be called out, and so the righteous have to stand up and call out the wicked as well. So not just let the wicked, you know, just do whatever they want. And of course, the media and all these things. And I'm going to address some of that. And so uh, I was teaching uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was teaching at a conference. Pastor Mark asked me to preach at their camp meeting, a couple of messages on end time. So I'm always now, I'm just kind of, it's just kind of almost becomes a hobby because you you got this to study for and you're just your quiet time. So it's kind of just books that I'm reading and things. But I really got stirred about Noah and what Jesus said about the last days and and the thing, really, what I want to bring, up, bring out and why I'm doing this, right, injecting this right in the middle of a series that we're doing, is it's important that we understand in the last days there's a bright side and there's a dark side to the subject. There's a bright side and there's a dark side. There's, there's good and then there's evil. And 
they, they are coexisting together. How many understand what I'm saying? I mean, and, and what I'm saying is this is not just the world and the church. It's also what's in the church. Hallelujah. And so we need to mention it, or what happens is we give people a one-sided impression of the condition of the world. I mean, if you don't talk about what's going on in the world, or for example, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of ministers, well, we just want to talk about the harvest. Oh, yeah, the, the, we're about to step into the greatest revival. Well, you know, I believe in revival, but we've been in revival. We've been in an outpouring. This is book of Acts 22. So, yes, things could happen, but it may be more pockets, you know, where revival breaks out and there can be a, you know, a, a, an awakening across America. Man, I'm all for it. But we need to understand there's also darkness sweeping across America, not just America, but the world. So there's, gonna, there's a coexistence of what's taking place and what's happening. If we only speak about the good, then what happens is we give people an unrealistic sense of optimism that becomes shattered in the face of reality concerning the times and what's going on. Or if we speak only of the evil and leave people with a sense of hopelessness, well, you know, we don't want to just leave everybody going with a, you know, out the door. Oh, man, that was a downer. Think of, man, all the hell's going, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, it's true, but so some things are going to get worse and worse, and then some things are going to get better and better. And I'm one of the things that's going to get better and better. How about you? I mean, Christians are the things who should, we should be getting better and better. You know, because even though, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think people, if they're not careful, they say, all this bad's going on, and what use is it to pray? No, we're called to pray. We're the church on the earth. We are to pray. I mean, that's part of the harvest, and that's part of praying for the rain. And so we, we're, Jesus even said in the last days, prayer is what keeps you alert. Prayer, so make sure that that's on your front burner. That that's, not just, that's just not something that we leave up to the ministers or, or, the, or the extra religious people. You should have a prayer life and you time where you just talk to God. Sit on your front porch, your back porch, take a walk and just pray in the Holy Spirit and just talk because you need to be at the right place at the right time. And you, you need doors of favor open up for you to where, you know, the world should look and see us and go, wow, how are you doing that? I'll show you how it's called the light. Did you find Isaiah chapter 60? Verse 1, arise, shine, for your light has come. Well, did the light come? I mean, oh, Jesus is the light. He said, I'm the light of the world. In him is light, and that light is the life of men. So we have that light. He said, that light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Everybody say glory. Well, we know we've been teaching about it. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're transformed into his likeness and in his image from glory to glory. So there is a measure of glory and more as we walk and as we look at God and grow in God, there's more glory. That glory includes your finances. That glory includes your life. That Just the glory of God on you. Glory to glory. And then we're going to hit a glory. The glory of God is what changes us to the point that, that in a twinkling of an eye, we hit glory. We get fullness of glory. In John 17, Jesus prayed, Father, let the glory that's, be upon, that's been upon me, let it be upon them. So we have an element of glory and that we walk in and that we grow in. No, I mean, glory is a big subject. But the glory of the Lord has risen where? Upon you. Now, there's, there's some dual references here. I believe part of this has to do with Jerusalem because Jesus in the millennium is going to rule from Jerusalem. But this also has to do with the church because we rule and reign with him. So there's actually some good news right here for you, for us as the church. For behold, now watch this, darkness will cover the earth. Everybody say darkness. So this is before, right before Jesus comes, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people's. Well, how are you going to escape the darkness with the light? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, watch this. It says, Satan is the god of this world, of this age, and he's blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the glory of God in the face of Christ. So who does the blinding? The enemy does. And he's really good at blinding people. Darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you. Say, bring it on, Lord. And his glory will appear upon you. 
Verse 3, nations will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Hallelujah. Now, you can read on in here, and it's pretty amazing, some millennial uh, pictures of what's coming. But this is what I want you to see. Side by side within, within the darkness, there's the glory of God upon his people. I mean, even in Ephesians, Paul called us the glorious church. That's, that's the kind of church Jesus is coming for. A church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Now, I don't think that's something we do on our own. We don't make that happen on our own. He makes us the glorious church without spot, wrinkle. He's the one that takes that out. But we don't have to be discouraged, listen, about the darkness that we see taking place. And you see a lot of it in the media, more and more. But we don't have to be unrealistic about it either. In other words, we don't put our head in the sand and, and oh, our president, we wouldn't, it, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm, I, I, sometimes I just want to slap the TV. I don't mean just our, our president, but the, just administration and things that are going on. You're, you almost get so disgusted, and I catch myself that I need to pray. I need to pray for him. I need to pray for what's going on. I, man, Lord, we need mercy. Help. The people need help. And so, so much is changing, and it's changing so fast. I mean, just since 9-11, we're the first generation. Think about when you talk about signs and things, we're the first generation that's had to deal with Islamic terrorism. No other generation has ever, ever had to deal with Islamic terrorism. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, and there's, there's things that they believe, they call it the Mahdi. Muslims believe that when the Mahdi comes, he'll come when there's total chaos on the earth, and they're the ones that are supposed to make the chaos happen. When they do jihad and all that kind of stuff, which means to annihilate Christians. And Anyway, I don't have time to go into all that. But, but there's so much that we're, our generation right now, and what we're dealing with, it's just changing every day and just crazy. And so because of those things, uh, and, and understanding the light and the darkness and what's happening, I want you to, uh, you know, you don't have to turn there, but if you write it down, make a note. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, because I don't want to read the, the whole parable, but uh, in Matthew 13, 24 through 30, it's the parable of the wheat and tares. The parable of the wheat and tares, Jesus said it's about the end times when Jesus returns to the earth to rule and reign. And when he comes back, he said there will be a harvest. And what's going to happen is the angels will come and reap that harvest. But he saw the parable of the wheat and tares. He said, basically, that a man, a farmer went and sowed wheat in his field. And at night, an enemy came and he sowed tares into the field. And as they begin to grow up, the wheat and the tares are going together. So the, the, the laborers said, well, master, do you want us to go pull up the tares? And the master said, no, let them grow up together. Lest when you try to pull up the tares... You pull up the wheat as well. So it's a picture of the ends of the age. And here's the thing. Tares are like wheat or like weeds. Or, you know, they're, they look like wheat, but they're not wheat. They don't produce anything. Listen, I said they don't produce anything. And so the picture here, one, one commentator says this picture, they're, they're basically a picture of believers and counterfeit believers. Because they look, they look the same, but they're not. They're one, one, one is producing and one's not. So you have to wonder, if you don't produce any fruit, you might be a tear. So what, you know, the thing that's interesting about agriculture is the same climate conditions that ripen the wheat, ripen the tares. So you got them all growing together. And so we have a ripening of wheat and tares. And so, you know, there, an interesting question to ask is what, what kind of condition is causing both the wheat and the tares to ripen together? And here's the answer, permissiveness. What's causing everything just to flourish? It's called permissiveness. We're living in a generation that's incredibly permissive. Even in church, today almost anything goes. Really, you know, just because a church is called a church might not be what you think church is. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not saying we're, we're the church or anything like that. I'm just saying across the board. I mean, I mean, sometimes people, you know, there can be great Catholic churches and there can be other Catholic churches depending on what they believe, what they do. Do they produce fruit? Are they reaching people? Any type of church, charismatic church, Baptist church. I grew up in Hines 57. Mom was Episcopal. Dad was Methodist. Uncle was a Baptist youth pastor. I went to a Church of Christ school. I got something from all of them. Involved in a Methodist student organization. So thank God for, for, for church. Church. 
But if you're not producing fruit, if you're not growing, you have to check up on yourself and make sure that it's a place where God's there and things are happening. You're growing. Can I get an amen? But because of permissiveness, because of the permissiveness of society, incredible permissiveness, we might call it, 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 it just makes, it makes people have to make a choice. Well, what will I indulge in? Because depending on what's being taught, you might think it's okay. What can I indulge in? Or how close to the world can I get without falling in? Remember, one of, it's, we have clear instruction. James says, love not the world or the things in the world. For he that loves the world is an enemy of God. So we're just passing through, right? I mean, we're citizens of heaven. This life is real brief. Life is real short. And so you got to know who you are and where you're going. So one more verse here before I kind of get to where I'm going. Revelation 22, just to kind of solidify this thought. Revelation 22, 7, Jesus, right before he comes. Now, this is in context of right before he comes. He says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, again, in context, it's right before the the Lord returns, verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And the one who's filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still be righteous or practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still be holy himself. Basically, what he's saying is you don't have long. So whatever you're going to do, do it. If you're going to be filthy, be filthy. If you're going to be righteous, be righteous. Are you here? That's what he's saying. If you're going to, be, if you're going to do wrong, do wrong. But, you know, you don't have much time to do it. Whatever you're going to do. Because I'm coming quickly. So here's the bottom line. Basically, when you look at that, you just say, there's no sitting on the fence. Do you see any fence sitting in there? It's either one or the other, and that's where this thing is going to. It's either one or the other. And if the Holy Spirit is in a church, he electrifies the fence. I'm going to tell you straight up. That's why some people can just go sit down in a church and go for years, never change, never do anything, never be challenged. And I'm not necessarily saying it's because of the leadership of that church. And again, I'm not picking on the church. I'm just talking about, because I'm fixing to give you a verse here. But, but I'm just, it's easy for people just to, just to not be challenged, not in their faith, not, not grow in the, in, the, in the doctrine and teaching of Christ, which Paul instructed Timothy. So there's, there's, there's a principle illustrated in the life of Abraham that I want you to see in Genesis chapter 15. And God, God explained to Abraham that his descendants would be enslaved for 400 years and then they're going to come back in the land. You remember that? He cut a covenant with Abraham. When he cut covenant, he said, your descendants are going to go into, into a land. They went into Egypt and they were slaves for 400 years. But he said, they're going to come back into the land. And in verse 15, he said, as for you, you're going to go to your fathers in peace. And you'll be buried at a good old age. Everybody say, that's me. Jesus tarries. I'm going to be buried at a good old age. Amen. My mama said, full of sap. Verse 16, now watch. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now notice that. The iniquity. So God says, the reason that this is going to take place is the, 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 the iniquity of the Amorite in the land that they were going to come back into. He says it's not complete yet. One of the principles you see in Scripture is God reaps the harvest when the iniquity is full. You got to, it's important to understand that God reaps the harvest when the iniquity is full. And some, you know, the harvest of righteousness and the harvest of wickedness at the same time is going on at the same time. You got the picture? So sometimes, I mean, I don't know about you, but we wonder, you know, Uh, You know, we have this thought, we wonder, well, why doesn't God, you know, with all this wickedness, with all this stuff going on, why doesn't God do something? You ever thought that? Well, he's waiting for the harvest. He's waiting for, even James says that the husband waits for the precious fruit of the earth. But even in Armageddon talks about the grapes and the, anyway, I don't have time to go there right now. The harvest, let's just talk, let's just talk about wickedness just a minute because that's where we're going. The harvest of wickedness 
I mean, even right now, it's shocking. But see, we're being desensitized through media, all the kind of stuff that's going on. And, and, and we're at the end, I'm telling you. How close is the end? The end could be six, three years, could be this year. I mean, there's, there's nothing that has to take place in order for the rapture to take place. I mean, basically, put it in a nutshell, he, I mean, so it, it's not time to be discouraged or lose our faith in all the things that are going on. So with that being said, and, and you understand, again, the whole picture I'm trying to set up is you see, you see the wickedness and the good, you see the good and the bad taking place at the same time. God calls both of them the harvest at the end, but one's going to go to one place and one's going to go to another place. So now let's go to what Jesus said, Luke chapter 17, we'll wrap this up. Luke chapter 17, Jesus is speaking in, his, in verse 26, and just as it happened in the days of Noah, now what happened in the days of Noah? Anybody know what happened? You know, y'all know who Noah was, right? Noah was a righteous man, one of the only ones actually in, a, in the world. Noah was a right, he's a preacher of right. The Bible says he's a preacher of righteousness, prophet, you could say like that. And uh, God, by, Hebrews 11 says, by faith, God came and said, I, I want you to, and so by faith, he built this huge ark. And you can read the rest of the story, but it says that just as it happened in the days of Noah, so what well, the world, why? Because something's coming, a flood was coming. So he's preparing an ark for his family because God's going to flood the whole, wor whole world. So it says, as it, just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be as in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, he's talking about prior to the return of the Lord. It'll be in the days of the son, it, it'll be as the days of the son of man. Now, if you skip to verse 20, he's going to say something. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. Verse 28, and it was the same as happened in the days of Lot, verse 28. So we have two pictures, the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Everybody say Noah and Lot. It's interesting, both were rescued, even Lot. Now, we know Lot didn't have the best, greatest of life, but the Bible even says that Lot was righteous. Even though he was living in a place, and, it, and where he was, it vexed his soul. Everything that was going on, but he's, he's got his whole family in a place. He shouldn't have had them there in the first place. But just like in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, the condition of the times before the Lord's return is going to be just like Noah and Lot. So we have a very specific scriptural standard of reference something that we can look at, all right? And so we're going to look at those uh, two references, Noah and Lot. And I've got six distinctive features of that time. I'm going to give you five of them right quick. The other one, I'm going to give you the one with Jesus. What did Jesus say? And I'll tell you what that was. So, so let's look first at God's dealings in the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Woo, I've got to hurry. Uh, verse 1 says, now it came about when the men began to multiply. Now, this, this will kind of raise some eyebrows right here. Y'all ready for this? Lord, just give me utterance right here. Now, it came about when, when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, now these are angels, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now, that's an interesting picture, uh, because I believe that's a picture of the timeline of man. If you multiply 50 jubilees by 120, you get 6,000 years. So man's dominion on the earth is 6,000 years. It could also be 120 years from that time point. God says, all right, it's coming. No, God's telling Noah, from that point, 120 years, I'm going to be done with this thing. So Noah had a pretty good idea. A lot of different ways to look at it. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came to the daughters, came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, basically what happened here, this first example, this first feature that I want to bring about, this provoked God. There's a lot of things that are provoking God up to this point, but the intermingling of, of angelic beings in sexual relations with human women, God was not happy about it. Matter of fact, God did something about it at that time. And um, you have to know there are certain boundaries within the Bible that God has set, and when those boundaries are crossed, judgment is not far away. For example, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, 31, 
when we talk about communion, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, the Bible says if we judge ourselves, we won't be judged. See, sometimes the only reason that things haven't happened in our life is because God's merciful and he's, he, gives us, he gives us space to repent. Aren't you glad? I said he gives us space to repent. Doesn't mean he does it, but it's almost like the umbrella's lifted and we get on the enemy's territory and we're judged. So the Bible says if you judge yourself, you won't be judged. So these angelic beings crossed the boundaries between the spirit world and the natural world and it brought judgment. This is taught, you know, Jude talks about it. Second Peter talks about it. Matter of fact, in Jude, or even, at, well, in the book, of, there's a lot you could go here. Revelation says that during the tribulation period, there's actually some of these angels that, that specifically crossed over are bound up in the Euphrates River. And the Bible says at a certain point of judgment, they will be released out of the Euphrates and they're going to wreak some havoc. So, you know, we're living in a spiritual world. Paul said in Ephesians 6, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this world's darkness and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. But Jesus said, behold, I give you authority over principalities and powers, over all the work of the enemy. But we, we, we come up against, we, we, we have a spiritual battle that we're in. And so, you know, a lot you could say, this is kind of where some of the how many of you had to take Greek mythology in school like I did? I mean, that really helped you out, right? But, you know, some of that in, in literature, that's where that came out of. And they're actually, you know, it's across the board. But, you know, for example, you know, the word mighty men, the Greek word mighty men actually means heroes. And that's where that word comes from. And that's who these people were. And the title now for the, the title for giants is actually Nephilim. Nephilim, it, it's from the Hebrew word to fall. So it really doesn't mean giants, it means fallen beings. So the term, now watch this, the term sons of God, he's talking about when the sons of God came and cohabitated with the daughters of men. The word sons of God is used three times in the book of Job, and every time it's referring to angels. I'll give you this last one, Job 38, 4. Where were you? God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know, or who stretched the line of it? Or on what were, its base, what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? What I want you to see from all this is in the days of Noah, there was an infiltration from the satanic kingdom among human beings. And so today's wickedness and immoral outbreak it's partly due to just satanic infiltration. I'm not talking about necessarily that angels are cohabitating with women and so forth or things like that in these days. But what I am saying is we are dealing with some demonic forces that I don't think even in the Bible says in, in Revelation that Satan, he knows his time is short and he's come full force. So we're dealing with these things. Darkness, like Isaiah said, darkness will cover the people. Gross darkness. One translation says gross darkness. So when I talk about satanic infiltration, even Paul writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul said it, the Spirit explicitly says in the last days men shall fall away from the faith being, being seduced by seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So you got to know the word. Praise the Lord. Now the falling away means a gradual, in other words, they just all of a sudden turn and go out, but it's a gradual falling away. How does that happen? When well, we're not challenged. COVID happens and when now church doesn't seem to be a big priority. Really don't even have to go to church on Sunday nights or Wednesday nights anymore. And maybe if I just show up every once in a while. And you understand what I'm saying? And then gradually people who really had faith at one point were really stirred up and excited and fired up for God. Now where are they today? What happened? Well, the enemy came Gave them a gut punch. Something happened. They're like, well, why did God allow that to happen? Well, we, we face an enemy. So there's a great challenge. So the second problem here that I want you to see, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the problem here is basically a corrupted thought life. We were talking about that last Wednesday. We're, we're, we're talking about thinking, thoughts, and imaginations. If you don't renew your mind, it'll go places that you don't want to go. 
It's your mind. And it's a terrible thing to waste. So when the thought life of humanity becomes poisoned, we're at the end. What do you mean? Well, the poison of media, social media, pornography, rampant, you name it, television. I mean, that's, that's, that's really the major. If you talk about when, I mean, if you just looked in history and when TV and things began, everything, people get their morals from TV. Everything, media, society, that, that's where the morals are. And so everything just kind of begins to light, get less and less, I guess, when it comes to a standard. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, erosion is basically a good word for it. Moral standards have become eroded because of all the things that we face. And so the comparison of Noah's day and our, our day is very relevant. I mean, I mean, I've shared in the past just different things. They, you know, we used to think, man, what they did back in that day is barbaric. What we do today is worse, 10 times worse than what they did. I mean, the abortions and all that takes place. And I mean, I just read this morning. I, 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 mean, I, I just read this morning. A couple just got, you know, indicted, thrown in jail because the husband, it was a, the husband was raping the 11-year-old girl twice a week for three years. Stepchild. And, and was threatening, if you say anything, I'll kill her. But she was involved with it in the beginning, and then, you know, but anyway. I'm th- that kind of stuff. We, we, we just have no idea of all this, the trash that's going on. And when we hear about it, we just think, man, and you almost, it makes you sick at your stomach a little bit, but, but, but that's just... That's probably small potatoes compared to stuff. I mean, the corruption, governmental corruption, all that's going on. You understand what I'm saying? I know it almost sounds like a downer, but, but if, we don't, if we don't bring both sides, it can, you can kind of stay on the downside. But the glory's going to rise. And so we need to know what's going on, what's taking place in these days. So number three, another feature that we see in the days of Noah is corruption and violence. Verse 11 says, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Can it get any more violent than it is? I mean, I mean, come on now. Cities just, I, I don't know if y'all saw, sometimes I watch Fox News, and these, these little kids, these policemen were in Chicago, they come to do something, these little, these little kids were trying to hit the, hit the police officer. I mean, how, how does a kid learn how to do that kind of stuff? But all the different things that are going on, filled with violence. What are we seeing today? Violence is off the charts, as well as corruption at every level. But here's the crazy thing. It's almost normal. We think it's normal. You know, somebody doesn't get what they want, well, they just use violence to get it. Just kill somebody. Shoot somebody on the street, you know, for their iPhone, for their tennis shoes. I mean, it's just crazy, right? Right? And, and here's the thing, young people today don't have any standard to compare it to. But when you're 58, you've been living for a little while, you can look back and say, man, I mean, I got in trouble for chewing gum, you know. <laughs> you're smacking some gum, you got in trouble. Right? And you probably got busted for it if you had an attitude. And now you got parents leaving the educational system because the kids are so out of control. And you got, you got you, a shortage of everything, shortage of referees because parents just go off on the, ref, on, the ref, on the referees because they didn't like the call that they made. I mean, people are just getting crazy. What is it? It's demonic. That's what it is. It's lawlessness, and it's, and it's no love. Love's growing cold. Man, it's crazy. And so, again, today we accept the violence as normal. I mean, now when you travel... Wasn't that long ago, you didn't have to go through all that security. You, had, you didn't have to basically get down to your underwear, you know. And go, I mean, but, but you got you know, you to go through beepers, and, and all your luggage has got to get checked. And, you, and they know they checked it because they leave this little slip in there. We went through all your stuff in your underwear. And they check everything, right? It's like the frog in the kettle. You know that parable? You know, they say, you know, they, you put a frog in, in, in some boiling water, and he'll jump out. But if you, if you put him in there and you just turn it up a little bit at a time, he just becomes desensitized to the environment, and eventually, he's cooked. Time for some frog legs. Verse 12, watch, says, God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. All flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. 
The fourth thing we see is, this is biblical language for sexual corruption. Sexual corruption. Their whole way of relating sexually had become corrupt. It's immoral, unnatural, perverse, immorality, homosexuality, all the alities. It's all, it's all, and it's just off the charts. Today, one out of every four girls has been sexually molested. One out of every, and that's probably one out of every five boys. That's what they, that's statistics. One out of every five. So, I mean, we're talking about immoral, unnatural stuff that, it's just, it's not right. The last, the fifth feature, and I'll close, I'm out of time. The, the fifth feature is found in Genesis chapter 19, and it's in the days of Lot. So these are things that Jesus said you can compare what's going on here with what's going on here, and you know he's about to come back. As well as all the other signs and everything else that we tend to look at and talk about. Genesis chapter 19, go there. Genesis 19, verse 4. Now, how many remember what's going on with Lot? Lot's in a city called Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not a good place to be. It's basically free for all. And uh, God actually came to Abraham and said, I'm, I'm fixing to destroy this city. And Abraham intercedes and so gets all the way down. Lord, if there's just five people, will you spare it? And God says, if I find five, I'll spare it. I guess he only found one. Wasn't enough. And, but Lot, I think it was the mercy of God. Lot got rescued. Though, so the, angel, the angels actually come into the city. And so a lot of the people see these angels come. And Lot, through his hospitality, invites the angels into, into his home. And so verse 4 says, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. Everybody say young and old. So we got, we got a big crowd going on here. And the people from every quarter, verse 5, and they called to Lot and said to him, we, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. NIV says that we might have sex with them. So you done got to a reprobate mind now. So the fifth thing that we see, as far as the feature that's going on, we're talking about these six things. The whole city was given over to homosexuality, and they're violent about it. And I don't know about you, but one thing you see about all the homosexual uh, agenda and all that's going on, it's violent now. I mean, you go to some cities and you try to come against it, you, they'll kill you. I mean, you're, it's, it's serious business. And it's the same today. Homosexuals are no longer timid. They're open. They're right out front. Exactly as it was in the days of Lot. Exactly. I mean, it, it wasn't a, a few years ago until, I mean, just wasn't that long it, when it kind of became, quote, acceptable for people to come out of the closet. And they start coming out by the woodworks, right? Because they want, they feel it's acceptable now. It's okay. Well, listen, I'm not against any homosexuals. We love, we love people. We don't condone lifestyle. We love people. God says it's sin, well, we're not here to judge, we're here to preach the truth. But the Bible says if you're wrong, you repent. And you can be saved, and you can be healed, and that's a whole other issue there. So, can you see the, the comparisons of what's taking place that Jesus said, you can see right before he comes back. And it's, any one of these, you can see, it's, it's just wide, it's wide open out there. So, one more time, these five features. Number one, satanic infiltration. Number two, corrupt thought life. Number three, violence. Number four, sexual corruption and perversion. Number five, just open, violent homosexuality. And there's no society that has ever lasted that hit that point. You know that? Now, the sixth thing... I'm going to talk about Wednesday night, unless the Lord wants me to do it Sunday, but, but right now I'll do it Wednesday night. The sixth thing that Jesus himself pointed out is what we're going to get to, and, and it's back to what he specifically said, and he mentions four things, and, uh, and I'm going to cover that in, in a little more detail. But here's the thing I just want to bring out to you this morning. There's so many people that are sitting in the water that if they knew what kind of water they were sitting in, they would jump out. They would jump out. They would say, I better get out of here right now. So I know I'm talking to the choir this morning, right? But, you know, it's always good to just check up and say, hey, Lord, 
I'm examining myself. Am I in the faith? Am I believing God? Am I, am I pursuing Him? He's first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Did you learn something this morning? So why are we bringing these up? Well, because, you know, even though we see, and you probably see more bad media news-wise than you see good. I mean, really, it's true. I mean, because the bad is what sells. That's what keep, keep people glued on. But it's hard to hear about all the good things. That's why you need to be in church, encouraging people and staying up with what's going on. But, you know, there's even just as far as, you know, the Middle East and things that are going on. Our president was just over there this week. I'll tell you what was really an eye-opener. When, when he was in Jerusalem and Israel, and he had his meeting with Lapid, and they were basically disagreeing on, on Iran and their policies and and, and our president wants to wants di diplomacy, you know, want to talk about it. And that's been working for Iran for a long time because they haven't slowed down on their nuclear program and what's happening. But Lapid's got saying, no, that's not how it's going to work. We need to be able to defend ourselves, and we're not going to let them get a nuke. But then here's what's happened. When he left there, his mo if you look at the his motorcade, he had, a, he had an American flag and he had an Israeli flag. He went over to the Palestinian hospital, and as he's going, they took the Israeli flag off there. And then, and then, and then on top of that, I forget who our... Um, what's our spokesman? They, they want to start a Palestinian uh, consulate in Jerusalem. They're trying to, that's not good for us as a nation now because anybody that goes against Israel and tries to divide their land, that's bad news. The Bible says that nation will be annihilated. So, but he, they want to try to set up this, so, so Biden's pushing this Palestinian state along with the Israeli state. And, and anyway, so, whether they go very far with that or not, you know. So what do you do? We pray for our nation. We pray for our president. We pray for what's going on. Hallelujah. And we let our light shine. That's the main thing. Let our light shine. Come on, why don't you stand up? Hallelujah. I'm going a little bit over here. Praise the Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. So there's good, and it's getting gooder. Right in the midst of the bad. We're rising. We're shining. Hallelujah. Our light has come. And our name, here's the main thing, right? It, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? How many got your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's the main thing. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Come on, let's praise Him. Father, we just thank You this morning for Your Word. We thank You for Your truth that sets us free. Your Word that challenges us. Hallelujah. Sometimes even gets right in the middle of our situation and judges the thoughts and intentions of our heart. And so, Lord, we just thank you this morning. We pray for souls. We pray for people to get their hearts right, to come into the kingdom. We thank you for the harvest. We thank you for this church, Lord, that you, you, you have placed us here on this planet. You've given us a call for such a time as this. Hallelujah. And we thank you for your favor upon us. And we love you and we praise you. While your head's bowed, eye closed. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I need to get my heart right. I'm not sure if I was to die right now, I'd go to heaven, and I want to have that no-so salvation. I want to know that if something happened to me, I would go to heaven. I would meet Jesus. If you're not sure about that, you can be sure about that. So I want to pray for you right now. Everybody's with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. If that's you, you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I need to get my heart right. I want to, I want to know that I know Jesus. Lift up your hand real high right now. Anybody like that? I want to make sure everybody in here is saved. Hallelujah. I'm on my way to heaven. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. All right. Everybody just say this out loud with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me, for giving your all. I ask you to cleanse me, forgive me of all sin. I choose to call you my Lord. I want to live for you. Help me be all that you want me to be. Lead me and guide me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Did you learn something this morning? Well, don't miss Wednesday night. We'll, we'll finish that up and get back to what Jesus was saying. There's four things there that are really important. Amen. Good word, Pastor Bracken. Time to tighten things up. Tighten things up. That's right. Well, just a couple things before you go, guys. We have a lot of uh, groups meeting this week. Happy Hour, Glow, Spur. And if you want to vote for the Harvest Church top performer over there at the Next Step table, they are going to have the gift card. We're going to announce that here in a couple weeks. We love you. Join us back on Wednesday night for part two. And have a wonderful week. And you are dismissed.